Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with former NFL fullback Tyler Klutz is sponsored by Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. It's $38, and it's a way that you make a difference in a child's life, releasing a child from poverty, giving them food, education, vocational training, medical care, all done in the name of Jesus. Compassion does it right, and this is your chance to be a part of it. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, $38. Spend it. I promise you, you won't regret it by sponsoring a child with Compassion. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast, former NFL fullback Tyler Klutz joins us. And this journey, this podcast journey that we've been on has kind of been a whirlwind, but it's nothing compared to the whirlwind football journey that Tyler Klutz has been through. And on this episode, we talk a lot about Tyler just coming through being a college football player at Fresno State, where he was an all whack defensive end 2006 and 2007, and then going undrafted and then finding stops in the CFL, the AFL, the UFL. You might not even know what the UFL is, but he was a part of it. The CFL, AFL, UFL, and finally coming to the NFL with the Cleveland Browns in 2011 and then stops in Cleveland, Chicago, Houston, Miami, before finishing out his last three seasons with the Dallas Cowboys. It's a whirlwind, and on this episode of the podcast, we talked to Tyler about that whirlwind and just trusting God through the craziness of life. So many of us can understand that our lives are, are just full of, of ups and downs and roller coasters and every which way, and yet God still calls us to trust Him through that. And this is a great example from Tyler of trusting God through the whirlwind that is his football career. So let's get right to it. Without further ado, former NFL fullback, former college football player at Fresno State, Tyler Klutz joins us here on the podcast. Take a listen. Tyler, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate you having me. It's good to talk to you. I know we've met a couple times at a few different conferences, Mm -hmm. and I'm excited to kind of go and kind of dive through your journey, which I call the crazy football whirlwind (laughs) journey that is Tyler Klutz. So we're going to get into that in a minute. And, you know, with the NFL season having started here, and and you've now been out of the league three years as a retired Mm -hmm. player, I always wonder Mm -hmm. this. Do you still watch games now as a former player? Are you a, okay, it's Sunday, I got to sit on my couch and watch the games when the Cowboys are on, maybe the team that you were last associated with, or are you kind of like just busy with life? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I think, uh, you know, it changes life. You know, when you transition out, you expect everything to slow down and have more time to do things. And, uh, I think that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I, I love the game of football. Like there's, that hasn't wavered. I think, uh, I think just the challenge is, is, is life. And as, as you get further and further away from the game, there's less and less guys, you know, on the field, um, you know, you once once you play in the NFL, you stop watching teams and rooting for teams, and you start rooting for guys—guys guys that you played against, guys that you played with, uh, guys that you admire. Um, and so I watch I watch more for the guys that I know and root on the guys um, more so than I do teams. I do still watch the Cowboys, you know, having you know finished my career here, live here in Dallas. Um, so yes, I follow them, but. Uh, to say that I I set aside every Sunday, Monday, Thursday night, uh, that would that would not be accurate. <laughs> well, what I failed to mention was you have four children, including twins, <laughs> uh, who are less than two years old. So, yeah, uh, that would be a, something a little bit more of the priority than watching football games for sure. I, I, yeah, and they're not at the age where, you know, they're interested in statistics and fantasy football and, yeah. and all that stuff. So In about 10 it's, years, it'll get more fun in that sense, I think, uh, for that's sure. That's right. That's now, right. Now, it's interesting, your career, because I, as I remember, self, self you know, uh, professed Cowboys fan, I guess, here for, for many years, I remember you scored one touchdown in your entire career, which I mm-hmm. think is, is fascinating to me, and it was yep. one that was in the postseason. Yep. When you were with Dallas at the at legendary Lambeau Field, and what people mm-hmm. forget 
uh, or people remember, I should say, about that game was it was the Des caught it game, which right. was the infamous Des Bryant catch that it really has caused a lot of controversy and blew uh-huh. up all over social media and even has affected the NFL and in the rule changing game for so uh-huh. many years. And, and the Cowboys obviously ended up losing that game to Green Bay. 26 21 but what stands out for you because you caught a touchdown from Romo in that game your uh-huh. only touchdown what stands out about maybe that touchdown and why it was the only touchdown was it the only instance you ever had to score a touchdown and maybe just the overall memory of that game which honestly yeah. if you look back it was a pretty great football game even it though was. Dallas came out uh-huh. on the losing end yeah it was it was uh, it was definitely a bittersweet uh, experience. You know, Lambeau is such an iconic venue, and you, that's the stadium. And, and you know, you walk into it, you feel history. Like there's, I mean, that that's the epicenter of football in my mind as I was growing up. So to to catch a touchdown there, I mean, it was it was emotional. It was, I mean, there's so many things going through your mind. Uh, you know, that it was early in the game that put us up. Um, so yeah, I was excited about that, but the second it, second it was over, it was over and okay, we got the rest of the game to play. And then, you know, and then you sit on the bus after the game, after, you know, the unfortunate result, um, that's when the emotions come and it's like, uh, like the one opportunity that I've had in my career, you know, to end like this, but I still look back at that. Um, and, and I just am so thankful for the opportunity that that's what it was, um, you know, I was a fullback, so not a ton of opportunities to touch the ball. Uh, I think I caught, uh, you know, 10 passes in my career, 10, 12 passes in my career. So, it, you know, wasn't a ton uh, of opportunity. It was, it, but when they call that pass, you know, it's called, if it's a fire pass. So it's kind of the, the token fullback opportunity to get, to get the ball. When they called it, I still in my mind was like, now, you know, Romo's going to hit Witt or he's going to hit the receiver coming across the back of the end zone. Um, and then I see him looking at me. I'm like, oh, this is going to happen. Um, so it was a, it was really a fun deal. Um, you know, unfortunately, like you said, it didn't end the way that we'd wanted to. But just thankful, I mean, that you even get that opportunity. I mean, because how many people can say, one, that they played in Lambeau and then, two, that they scored a touchdown there, let alone in the postseason. Do you get the ball for that, or is that one where it's like, yeah, we lost? I don't, I don't even want to think about oh, yeah. it or talk about I, it. Oh, I held on to that thing. I hit it <laughs> under the bench. I put jackets over the top of it. Nobody, <laughs> I was coming home with that one for sure. That's amazing. Describe what it's like to play for the Cowboys. You played for a lot of teams, huh. and we're going to go through your journey in a minute because uh, mm-hmm. it is a crazy one. But describe uh-huh. what it's like. It's something different, I think, about playing with Dallas and sort of the prestige that comes with playing mm-hmm. for the Cowboys. Describe what that's like. Yeah. So full disclosure, I grew up in California and I grew up a 49ers fan. Ooh, and okay. uh, this was late eighties, early nineties when the rivalry was real. Oh, yeah. And so uh, it was, I grew up disliking the Cowboys. And to be honest with you, that perception didn't really change uh, until I stepped foot into the locker room. Um, you know, of, of all the teams. And, and like you said, we'll talk about it, but of all the teams that I played in, um, that was the one organization that I immediately felt welcomed and appreciated, mm-hmm. um, by ownership, by players, by coaching staff. Uh, and again, I, I played fullback. So it's kind of an underappreciated position now in the league. Um, but I mean, immediately Romo came up to me and welcomed me and, you know, thanked me for, for, you know, the, I, cause I came in on a Wednesday and played in Chicago, uh, that, that week. And, um, you know, it was it was an organization that completely changed my perception. You know, it was Hollywood and all these things from the outside, but you get inside and it and it, it's a family. Uh, my wife felt it, my kids felt it. Um, you know, from you know the women's groups to the team events to I mean everything across the board is first class, and it is the noise and hype comes from the outside. And it doesn't come from within. Um, and so it was, it was a pleasant surprise. And, you know, since then I've completely reversed roles and now there's, there's a, not a, not a hatred, but there's a, <laughs> there's a bitterness towards the 49ers. Uh, I haven't played them, you know, so many times in a Cowboys uniform. And, um, now, you know, I'm, I'm silver and blue. So. It's uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to have my perception changed. You, I remember you mentioned 2013 is when you were picked up and you had to play on a mm-hmm. on a game against Chicago. If I remember mm-hmm. correctly, is that the freezing cold Monday night game? Freezing cold, yeah. Freezing cold, like this is like five degrees above or even below zero type game. What's it uh-huh. like to play in a cold game like that? 
So it, uh, it's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge on, on, a, on a couple a couple scales, right? So there's a mental, mental challenge and they're like, okay, I've got to not think about the cold, think about my job, think about what I've got to do. And then as a fullback too, we don't play really consistently. So it's okay. You got to play here. You got two plays there. You got to play there. Um, and so, you know, luckily that game I played a lot. So you stay a little bit loose, yeah. uh, but you really just huddle up by the heaters uh, and just make sure that you're ready to go when your number's called. But, um, you know, I played in Canada, so I played in some pretty cold games, a couple games actually colder than that. Okay. Um, so I had learned a couple tricks of the trade, Vaseline on the arms, uh, medical rubber gloves under your gloves, um, you know, uh, ice bags over your in between socks. I mean, there's tricks of the trade that you learn um, to just, you know, take the edge off a little bit. But, you know, in a, a, a game like that, Chicago was a really tough team. Um, you know, we we didn't play well in that game as a team. Yeah. Um, but so that that also adds to uh, the temperature drop, I think. So it's tough, but it's it's a mind over matter kind of deal. And, you know, unfortunately, that that wasn't uh, that wasn't our element as a team that year. As we go through your journey, I was reading that you converted from, from pass rusher to fullback in college coming into professional football. What position, this is just, a, I guess, a personal interest question, what position mm-hmm. gave you more pain the morning after? Because you're in the trenches in either mm-hmm. one of them, right? And you're hitting someone mm-hmm. pretty much on every play. Is there a position that was more uh, sort of draining on the body than the other, or are they both kind of equal? Um, I would probably say, I would probably say I hurt more after defensive end. Um, you know, you're, you're in, I played quite a few more plays per game, um, which, which is part of it, but usually your hands and shoulders are banged up and you get your ankles rolled up on, uh, you know, as a fullback, there's fewer plays, but higher impact collisions. Mm. Um, but as you go through the season, your body really kind of becomes desensitized to that. Um, so you become more and more conditioned for it. So I would say defensive end, I hurt quite a bit more. And then, you know, in college, a little bit more passing, a lot more pass rush, but so there's a lot more, there's just a lot more going on, I think, than, than when I was a fullback, but you know, different passions for both, enjoyed both. I, you know, I was kind of one of those sick guys that kind of enjoyed the pain because I felt like I actually accomplished something. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, but it, uh, it, it was just different. But yeah, I would say defensive end probably was more draining on the body. We're talking to Tyler Klutz here, the former NFL fullback on the Sports Spectrum podcast. As we've mentioned, your journey is is crazy. In a nutshell, I'd like a, I'd like you to kind of take us through. All right, from college football, you play at Fresno State, uh, and you're all whack for those two years, and then you you go undrafted. So then, take us through and walk us through this sort of whirlwind uh, lifestyle that you lived as you pursued professional football, because there's so much there. Yeah. So, you know, I think like any college football player, your goal is to play in the NFL. And that was that really was my goal since I was four years old living in Vacaville, California, playing football at the park across the street. I I had this this sense that, okay, God's got put a passion in my heart. This is what I want to do. And I chased it and I chased it passionately my entire my entire life up to that point. And so draft day rolls around um, and. You know, I recognize the limitations that I had as a player, um, you know, not being real tall, not being long, not being fast, uh, which goes against you in the NFL, apparently. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I recognize, but I was hoping that production would would carry some weight with some scouts and some teams. So I'd had some interest, had a couple workouts, um, you know, so I, I didn't expect to be a first or second day guy, but I was hoping maybe sixth or seventh round or even an undrafted free agent because, I love the game so much that all I wanted was an opportunity and to say, okay, at least I had my shot in the NFL. Um, you know, draft day rolls around, no calls, um, no interest. And then, you know, free agency the following couple of days and yeah, phone didn't ring a single time. So I was really kind of faced with, with a dilemma and really, you know, internally I'm, I'm kind of battling and saying, okay, you know, why would God put this on my heart so much and give me such a passion and, uh, and then not even give me a chance. Um, and so it was, it was, it really was a challenge. Um, you know, 
luckily, you know, got answered and, and there was an opportunity to go up to the CFL and just continue playing. And at that point, I didn't care. I just wanted to play. Um, I didn't care if it was, I mean, I didn't care if it was in Monroe, Louisiana or Edmonton, <laughs> Alberta, wherever I could play. Um, you know, I would, I, I was okay playing. So I went up there, um, and played defensive end, continued on, on the defensive side of the ball. And, you know, I enjoyed the sport. I enjoyed the opportunity, um, you know, and, and maybe unrightfully so, but I felt like I had a, a good rookie year up there, um, and, you know, and played quite a bit and contributed a lot on special teams. And, um, I, I enjoyed football. So, uh, it was, it was, one of those, yeah, one of those moments where I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe he just had a different path for me. Maybe, you know, God's just teaching me something. Um, but surely he's going to bring me back to the NFL, like surely. Um, and so, you know, I finished that season going to the off season and, and how Canada works is, is you're in season, you're there and off season, there's nothing. You, you go home and you got six months off. Yeah. Um, and so I go home and I actually got a job back in Fresno, California, my hometown. And, um, and was working full time, training full time. And I got a call a week before training camp going into my second year from the new head coach. And, you know, and he used to say, Hey, you know, great to meet you. Unfortunately, I wish this was on better terms, but we're going to have to go a different direction. Um, you know, and we're not going to be bringing you back. So now again, I'll, you know, similar to draft day, I'm like, okay, God, what are you, what are you, what are you trying to tell me here? You know, I've put in, I put in all this time and work and, you know, I, I don't understand why this is happening. And I was, I was out of football for <laughs> until, you know, a whole nother year. So, you know, really this now I'm, I'm going two years after college where I'm away from the NFL. Yeah. Um, and so working full time, I'm actually working three jobs at the, at the, at the time, just trying to make ends meet. Uh, and you know, we can get into it later, kind of my motivation there, but, um, it was. It wasn't until uh, March of 2010, um, three weeks after I got married to my wife, um, mm-hmm. and uh, my wife sat me down, and you know she'd been supporting me through the, the whole process, and she said, "Hey, listen, you know, I, I see that you have football left in you. Um, I, I see that you know dream wavering uh, internally with yourself. Um, I want you to know you have my full support. You need to, if you need whatever you need to do, do it." Um, so we made the decision three weeks after we get married, um, that I'm going to leave and go play in the arena football league, uh, in Salt Lake city, Utah. And I, and I just said, you know, okay, we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. Uh, so I played in Salt Lake city for, for eight weeks. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was interesting. I lived <laughs> off of, uh, I lived off of subway coupons. Um, and yeah. you know, I'd have to, I'd have to walk, walk a mile and a half to the, the closest gym just to work out. And it was just a, a different, different level than I was used to. And, but it was, again, it was a good training. You know, the hardest part was being away from my, 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 my new bride at the time. Yeah. So um, she didn't come with you when you no, went she to the did not. Well, She had to work. We were, you know, I was making a thousand dollars a month. So <laughs> yeah. it was, you know, it was, it was a challenge financially uh, for us and, and she had a good job in, in California. So she stayed. Mm. Um, and so we spent, you know, all of our money to, for me on our bye week to, to book a flight back to California because there was a, a CFL workout uh, in Fresno. There was a UFL workout, which is the new developmental league at the time uh, in San Diego, which is about six hours away uh, Saturday morning. So workout CFL Friday, workout Saturday morning, San Diego, and then a workout Saturday night in Los Angeles, which is, you know, two hour drive north of San Diego. So spend money, fly back and, and worked out for the CFL team uh, immediately got in the car, drove to San Diego. We couldn't afford a hotel, so we had to sleep in sleep in our car mm. prior to prior to the workout. Uh, get up, you know, get the get the kinks out from sleeping in the car. And my wife is with me at that at that time, so you know she's a rock star yeah. uh, at this point. <laughs> she sounds like she's already a rock star the second yeah. she said, "Go pursue this," right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and and to be honest with you, that point was that was a gut check. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm chasing this dream of playing football. How, how selfish am I that one, I can't, I can't even financially support my, you know, my new wife. Um, and or she's sleeping in a car with me yeah. in a parking lot at a high school in San Diego. 
and you know and there was it was it was a tough time and um did and you so wrestle I, with the lord there tyler at all about god what are you doing is this really worth it what do you i mean you know you're trying to be the right husband you know the best husband you can be you're sleeping in a car you're trying to pursue this nfl dream and you're doing a tryout for it sounded like a ufl team i think you said mm -hmm. yeah. in san diego is mm -hmm. tell me about the faith aspect of wrestling with you know god in that in that sense yeah, so there definitely there definitely was some trials there. Um, you know, a, a lot like draft day, a lot like getting cut. Um, it was it was God. What are you trying to show me? I don't get this. Um, you know, I, I I don't even feel. I really don't even feel like a man right now. You know, yeah. every every dollar that we're spending is coming from my wife. Not that money has anything to do with with who a man is, but I, I can't provide. I can't protect. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, well, God, what are you, what are you showing me right now? Cause I don't see it. And I can't understand how this is a part of a plan that, that I feel like you put on my heart at a really, really young age. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm questioning what's going on. Um, you know, what's going on with, with my purpose and, and my identity, because my identity was 100% wrapped up in being a football player. That's what I'd always known. Um, so there was a lot of questions there. Um, but and again, you get the call though, right? Tyler, at some mm -hmm. point you get a call to go to the NFL. So mm -hmm. take me through going from Sacramento you play, you end up with the Sacramento yep. mountain lions, yep. which by the way, is yep. a, gr a great name for a team <laughs> and yep. playing in the UFL to getting a call to go to an NFL team. So start with that UFL experience and then uh -huh. how that led you to finally getting that call at, at the age of 25, 26 yeah. years old. Finally. Yeah. So, you know, to, I guess to, to prep that, I, I think the decision to go to the UFL was another move, uh, by the Lord to, to guide me, mm. uh, because I had an opportunity to go back to Canada after that workout that weekend to either go back to Canada, play a defensive end or go for a second workout for the Sacramento mountain lions as a fullback. Um, it was, it was totally a gut thing that, uh, a former long snapper at Fresno State, my alma mater, was a scout at the Houston Texans. The running back coach for the Mountain Lions came from the Houston Texans. Uh, they connected, brought up my name. The scout from Fresno State that works at the Texans said, hey, I've always thought that this kid can play fullback. Why don't you give him a shot to, to see if he can play, see if he can catch the ball, see if he can be a fullback. So I was, I was forced with, okay, I've got a contract, or I take a 100% chance pass up the contract to the CFL, take a chance and work out as a fullback in the UFL. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, when I'm in that car in San Diego sleeping with my wife, I'm like, God, what are you trying to show me? And he was showing me the woman that was next to me. And, and he was, uh, working through her because like she said, you got to start over and you got to play. She said, Tyler, I don't think that you're meant to play in Canada anymore. I think that you're meant to play fullback. I think that this is what you're supposed to do. We need to take the chance and trust that God's going to use that. And that's what we did. And, and I played fullback. And, uh, you know, I played one season um, in the UFL and immediately signed with the Cleveland Browns uh, following the season. Uh, and that's what got my opportunity in the NFL uh, was making that leap of faith and trusting that God was doing something with me in that transition from defensive end to fullback. Man, and then you, you end up in the NFL, and it's still mm -hmm. not like okay, I'm with the Browns, <laughs> and I'm going to be there for the rest of my career. That's Take right. Take me through just the journey of going. You want to go from Cleveland to Chicago to Houston to Miami to Dallas. Finally, mm -hmm. take me mm -hmm. through, and it's not a long journey there. It's five years no. or so. So yeah. take take me yeah. through the whirlwind five year NFL career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, went to Cleveland, and I didn't. I didn't. I, this was the NFL. This was what I'd prayed for for years and years and years. Um, you know, I you know I think that God is okay. Hey, I, this is what you're meant to do. This is where I want you. Didn't know why. Didn't know the purpose of that. But I knew that that's where He wanted me. So Cleveland, great. I'm here. I've arrived. Um, you know, and and I ended up being signed to the practice squad following training camp. This was the year after the lockout. Uh, but they had drafted uh, a kid out of Stanford, Owen Marisic, uh, in the fourth round to play fullback. And so a fullback being drafted in the fourth round, um, you know, that solidifies a job as a fullback. So uh, I, had a, I had a good camp, but um, signed the practice squad and the Chicago Bears called Tuesday before week one and said, hey, we want to sign you off the practice squad and we want you starting this Sunday. Um, I love the staff uh, in Cleveland uh, and I got comfortable there. But again, my wife is like, Tyler, 
you're 26 years old. Mm. You don't have time to be on the practice squad. Like this is an opportunity to play. I know it's scary, but this is something that, that I think that you need to do. So again, thank God I listened to her again. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we went to Chicago and, you know, and started every game there in Chicago that year, uh, was traded week one to Houston the following year, mm. um, played in Houston for the year, uh, Again, when we get comfortable, we're like, okay, God's got us where we need us. And then, again, uh, get released, picked up on, on waivers from Miami, start week one in Miami in my third year in the NFL. Uh, and then uh, I get released there. And this is this was where the, the other dark point in my, in my career was I was in Miami for five weeks and I get released. Um, we So – to, to paint the picture here, uh, my daughter uh, was uh, almost two years old. Uh, my wife was seven months pregnant with my with our second child. She had to move herself from and all of our stuff from H- our house in Houston to Miami. We were there five weeks. We just get settled. Literally, our furniture had just gotten delivered, and then we get cut. And now we've got to move it all back to we've got to move it all back to California. Hmm. Um, so in, you know, a five week period, we, we had to move 5,000 miles, um, and move three times. And this was all while she's five months pregnant. And so went back to California and I was, I was out of the league for eight weeks. And again, questioning God, what, what are you trying to tell me here? Am I done? Uh, I don't feel like I've accomplished what you wanted me to. Um, and, and so, you know, luckily eight weeks later, um, after really kind of an internal struggle, really with the Lord and identity, and and not knowing what's going, what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, we got a call from the Cowboys, who was my uh, my running back coach in Cleveland, uh, had come over to the Cowboys um, that season, uh, so got an opportunity, and and you know I mentioned earlier, loved my time with the Cowboys, and um, what God did though is He brought us to Dallas. And he showed us where our home was going to be. And in Dallas, that is where I think he meant for me to be from a leadership aspect, from a platform. Um, all the things that, that I felt like he had put on me to do in the NFL all accumulated, I think, in Dallas. Wow. Well, what about, um, you know, I talked to a lot of players, especially former players, about just connecting spiritually through teams, you know, team Bible studies and, yeah. and, uh, you know, chapel and things like that. And yet you're kind of only there for small amounts of time until you yeah. get to Dallas. Was that virtually mm-hmm. impossible for you to do that, to connect on a spiritual level through team, uh, chapels and Bible studies and things like that? It, it was and wasn't. Yeah. So when you're, when you're, you know, playing the NFL musical chairs game, it, it is, it is a challenge to really connect, but you know, the Lord, allows a deeper connection immediately. So guys like Josh McCown, Justin Forsett, you know, really some just rock stars in the league spiritually, there's an immediate connection. Matt Forte uh, is another one. Yep. Um, guys that guys that really um, just are, are men, men uh, with a heart for the Lord. And there's all, immediate connection. And those are the guys I'm still connected with. Um, you know, a lot of people ask, okay, who are the guys that you look up to the most? You played with Brian Urlacher and you played with um, Andre Johnson and you played with Arian Foster and Cushing and J.J. Watt uh, and Jason Witten and Tony Romo and DeMarco, all these guys. And they're all incredible men. And I'm not saying anything about that. But the, the guys that I looked up to the most were those spiritual leaders in the locker room. And those are the connections that happen immediately because only, only God can make those connections um, in, in the limited time that you're there. So yes, it was a challenge, but seeing those guys operate in the Chicago locker room and the Houston locker room um, allowed me to understand. Okay, this is the man that I'm supposed to be in the Dallas locker room. Um, you know, and John Kitna was was in Dallas with me for a week uh, when he came back when Romo got hurt in 2013. Right. Um, so I got a, a brief glimpse of him, and you know, talk about rock stars for the Lord. That that's that's one right there. Oh yeah. Um, and so uh, you know. 2014 and 15, I said, okay, you know what? No more sitting on a sideline. You know, God's allowing me to continue playing the game that I love, um, but it's not going to be for me anymore. It's going to be for him. And so that's, I think that was where my spiritual leadership started to evolve in, uh, in that locker room. 
And then, as it is so many times in football with many players I've talked to, they don't retire. Football mm-hmm. retires them, right? And That's right. You told me before our interview that you were – you weren't ready to retire. Um, so mm-hmm. take us through, you know, the end of your career and mm-hmm. 2015, the last year that you played with Dallas and how your career ended and walking through that transition to now being, uh, I guess, without a team for the first time in a long time. Yeah. Uh, so 2015 was a rough year for the Cowboys going four and 12. That was the year Romo, uh, Romo hurt his back against Philadelphia. Yes. Um, it was a, it was a tough year. Um, as a team, but personally, uh, it was probably one of my, one of my better years, uh, not statistically, but as you grade out, it's kind of hard to measure, uh, a fullback statistically, but, uh, you know, as I graded out, it was one of my better years and it was probably the most comfortable I felt, uh, you know, having just played the position a few years prior, uh, to that. Um, and so I'm feeling, okay, I think I got more left in the tank. I'm just starting to catch my stride. Um, and then I go into free agency and, and I'm, you know, anticipating getting the opportunity to come back to Dallas. Uh, and you know, it, it, it didn't happen that way. Um, and, and I, um, not that, not that I was upset or angry at Dallas. I was just like, well, I, guys, I, I'm cheap first of all, because, you know, right. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to require a big salary, but, um, you know, I, I feel like the leadership that I, that I bring to the table, you know, within the locker room, but then also, you know, how I've been playing on the field, you know, at least give me an opportunity to earn a job. Uh, but, but it wasn't there and, and the phone didn't ring after that. Um, you know, there really was, it was very little conversation. So, um, what I did is I got some advice from, uh, a good friend of mine that went through something similar and he just said, Hey, pick a date. And, and solidify that in your mind. Say, okay, if nothing happens by this date, God's telling me to move on and move on. Not that it's going to be easy, but at least you'll have more peace. Um, so that off season is I'm hopefully going to get a new job. Um, I'm starting to prepare myself starting and I want to, I want to emphasize starting to prepare myself yeah. uh, for the transition out of football. Um, you know, I would, there's nothing you can do to prepare leaving in a game, a game like football or any, really any professional sport where that's what your life revolves around day and night, year round. Um, but as you start to transition out, you know, it's, it really makes you question, okay, where has my identity been through this entire process? Luckily here in Dallas, I had a chaplain by the name of Jonathan Evans. Um, mm. most people know his dad, Tony, Dr. Tony Evans. Sure. And, uh, and we had, uh, we, we did a series in Hebrews, uh, in 2014 about identity and, uh, and, and really who are we playing for? Are we playing for man? Are we playing for fans? Are we playing for money? W- what are we playing for? Uh, and he asked that question. He said, because you're never going to satisfy any of those, any of those items. Um, he said, but if you're playing for God, who's above God? Nobody is. So if you satisfy God and you play for God and you play for him and his purpose for you, everything else falls in line underneath that. So it was a shift in my identity. And I'd mentioned earlier, I questioned what God wanted me to do because football was what I thought I was. But my identity was not in football. My identity and the reason I was playing in the NFL was for him, was in God. And so if God wanted me to move on, I had peace in that. If he wanted me to keep playing, I had peace in that. But I I, I made a shift in my my spiritual journey in that everything that I'm doing is for Christ and everything else will take care of itself. And it was an unbelievable weight off my shoulders through that, like you said, that crazy journey through football. Um, and it was, uh, as I made the transition, it was, it was the same. I just had to trust that God had something because I couldn't see how my football journey was going to play out. Just like I still can't see how God's going to use me in my, you know, in my life after football. Uh, but the one thing that is consistent is my life will always be in Christ uh, forever. And he's going to guide me where he needs me. And he's going to put me where he needs me. And, you know, to be honest, right now, you know, I'm three years out and I'm still not exactly sure what his purpose for me is. But I know that he's got me in a stage of preparation, just like. I was in the CFL preparing me for the NFL. Um, I'm in a, a stage of preparation and that he's going to do something with me and he's going to use me to advance the kingdom. 
It's awesome. We're talking to Tyler Klutz here, the former NFL fullback on the Sports Spectrum podcast. A couple more questions with you, Tyler. I, I know that you mentioned identity and struggling just with identity and being identified as a football player. What was the biggest adjustment or what has been, I guess, three years out now, the, been the biggest adjustment for you? I remember or just a couple of weeks ago on this podcast, we had Matt Hassel back and I asked him about, you know, the thing that he missed most about his NFL time playing. And he said just mm-hmm. being coached and being around this sort of regimented schedule of guys who are coming together for a common cause, you know, to, mm-hmm. to go to battle together. And it was a camaraderie there that yeah. is un. He couldn't replicate anywhere else. He hasn't been able no. to, whether it's a local church, whether it's uh, you know through ESPN where he's working now. I wonder for you, what's been that biggest adjustment from that football lifestyle to where you are now? Yeah, I couldn't agree with Matt anymore. Um, I think the, the challenge is, is guys, as they transition out, they think that they're going to be able to replicate that passion that they had for football uh, for whatever they're doing next. You know, for me being – commercial real estate. That's, I, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I just had, had an itch for it and I had an interest in it. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have the same passion for what's next. And it's, it's not accurate. I, I love what I, what I'm doing right now. Uh, but there's no way to replicate that. And one thing too, is that being, you know, really just type a highly motivated people in the NFL, um, you know, you think that, okay, hey, I can do this. I can self-motivate. I'm going to make sure that I'm up at, you know, five o'clock every single morning. And I'm going to work out and I'm going to get this. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to have the same motivation that I have for football. But one thing that's very different is he mentioned coaching. Um, and then the camaraderie with a the team, there's an accountability that's unlike anything else. Hmm. And so I'm very lucky with the company that I'm with it. There is a team mindset. But it still relies a lot on self motivation, sure. um, and it's it's just a different level. But when you have accountability to brothers that you know, and I'm and I use this term loosely, a lot of people say, "Oh, we're going to battle and we're going to do this," because I don't want to I don't want to disrespect our veterans because it's a completely different level. But you really do go into a high level of competition with your brothers, and you have to be accountable to them. And it's just in the in the business sector or whatever you do post football. It's very different because if I don't make if I don't make ten cold calls, um, you know, from two to three o'clock, um, nobody's gonna lose a game, you know. Yeah. So it's it's just a different it's just a different level of accountability and and guys and guys that are in the NFL thrive off of that and and do really well. And um, but there's a lot of guys that transition out of the game that that you know don't appreciate the tools that that we do have as players um, and don't think that those tools translate to what's next. And, and, you know, it couldn't be further from the truth. Um, there are a lot of things that professional athletes can do to transition into what's next, but it's just, it looks very different and, and guys, as they transition out, it's hard to recognize that on, on their own. And so it's, it's really, I think the guys that transition well are the guys that find spiritual mentors, business mentors, whatever it may be to help walk you through the process. Hmm. What about where you are in this season of life now? You know, your dad, yeah. too. So four kids, twins, mm-hmm. a four yeah. and a half year old son, a six and a half year old girl. Life is busy, obviously, yeah. with your wife, Tiffany, now yeah. married over eight years. Mm-hmm. What is the Lord teaching you during this season of life? What are you learning from God right now, maybe as opposed to maybe what you were learning a couple of years ago? Yeah, I think priorities. Uh, I think that was that's probably the biggest thing, uh, because in football, and, you know, unfortunately, wives have to go through this, that football is the priority. Like you have to put all of your effort and all of your focus into football. As you transition out, you recognize, okay, listen, it's got to be God first. It's got to be my wife second. It's got to be my kids third. And in that order, and, and you know, specifically wife first, kids second. Um, but then, and then work comes after that. And so for me, priority is really making sure that I focus on taking advantage of every minute that I'm home with my children and pouring into my children, you know, and teaching them, you know, who Christ is and why he loves us and, um, you know, how we can, we can, um, uh, you know, how we can be Christ like, um, in the, you know, growing the kingdom, be a, be a light really in kind of a dark world right now. Um, and really focusing on that. But the biggest thing is just enjoying where God has us now. Um, I, I want to say, I believe it's Psalm 16, um, talks about, you know, not looking for, 
uh, you know, the things of this, of this world, because uh, those really don't matter. Um, and, and stop looking forward, stop looking to what's next, enjoying the moment that God has you in because he has you here for a reason. And, and that's what it is with my kids. You know, every phase you're with your kids, you're like, Oh, I can't wait till they can drink a bottle or I can't wait till they're out of diapers or I can't wait till they can play sports or I can't wait till they're in school. You're always like, I can't wait to that next step. Uh, but I think God's showing my wife and I both that like, enjoy every minute of this because you're never going to get this back. And I mean, our, our, I mean, where our children are at is so beautiful. Our twins, the, the camaraderie that they have as twins and the dynamic that they have within each other that, you know, it's so funny to see two children grew up in the same, you know, at the same time in my wife's womb <laughs> and they're so different. I mean, so different personalities and, you know, the different phases they're at. It's just, it's incredible to see and appreciating that rather than, oh, I can't wait till my career takes off or I can't wait till they're in the next phase or I can't wait till I do this. But just being present and, and understand that God has me here for a reason and he's preparing me, preparing me for something, but enjoying the stage of preparation. He is Tyler Klutz, former NFL fullback, the whirlwind NFL journey that is Tyler Klutz. And just appreciate your heart, my friend. Thank you for joining us here in the podcast. And we'll definitely get you back maybe towards the end of the year and and talk a little more football maybe and some stories and share some stuff there. But appreciate you being on the podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate you. And we do appreciate Tyler Klutz for joining us here on the podcast. Great stories there of just the crazy football journey that so many of these players go, go through. It's not you know, the Tom Brady's of the world that go to one team and stay there for 18 years. Most of the football players and their journeys are a lot like Tyler's. You're just trying to make it and you're grinding it out and going from team to team and city to city, not knowing where you're going to be in the next few weeks. I mean, that story of him going to Houston and then there for eight weeks and then suddenly cut and then going to Miami and thinking you're settling in and then getting cut and then having to go to Dallas and move all the furniture and just the whirlwind of being married. I mean, I think it gave, it can give you a greater appreciation of the lifestyle that football players, many of them live in kind of the whirlwind journeys that so many of them have. So I appreciate Tyler joining us and being open and transparent about the adjustment to life after football as well and how his faith in Christ has guided him there. So appreciate Tyler. We also appreciate you for listening and we appreciate Compassion International for sponsoring this podcast. 150,000 children came to know Jesus Christ through the great work last year being done by Compassion International. You make a difference in a child's life. We all want to make a difference, right? Where can I, where can we, uh, you know, help others? Where can we take the hard earned money that we have and know that it's going somewhere that can help someone? Well, compassion provides that compassion.com slash sports spectrum. Go to that website, look at the children that are available, waiting for you to sponsor them and pray about it. Talk with your family, find your child and then sponsor them $38 a month. That's all it is. Think about it. That's like what, $3 a day. Maybe you spend that on a cup of coffee. This provides food, educational training, medical care, all done in the name of Jesus by you sponsoring a child through Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. I promise you, you won't regret it. Sponsor a child today. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. You can reach us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum. We're, of course, on Instagram and Facebook as well, sharing all of our content there. You can email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com, jason at sportspectrum.com, and let us know about what you thought of this podcast, about Tyler's journey, and, of course, any guest ideas that you might have. Please send them our way. We're always looking to, to hear great stories on the intersection of sports and faith, and they don't have to be NFL players or baseball players or hockey players players. They could be the high school coach that has an amazing story on sports and faith. So please send those ideas, those suggestions along to me, Jason at sportspectrum.com. And of course, you can find all of our content, every single piece of content that we produce here at Sports Spectrum over at sportspectrum.com, which is a great website for you not only to get daily devotionals, 
every single morning at 6 a.m. You get first-person articles written by these athletes themselves through the increase, which is really great. And then you get just the stories that are happening in the sports world from these athletes who love Jesus and talking about their intersection of sports and faith in their journeys. So check it out, sportspectrum.com. And you can also subscribe to our magazine now for just $18. We've cut the price in half. We'll get five issues of a really great tool to hand out at men's groups, at churches, at youth groups, sporting events, wherever it might be. Sports Spectrum magazine is legit. You want to get that. You want to get subscribed to that magazine and get that for yourself because not only will you read it, then you'll hand it off and give it to someone else to hear the stories on the intersection of sports and faith. You can subscribe over at sportspectrum.com. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great day.